What's up, gifted family? Welcome to another episode of the show that is the GP YouTube. Just a reminder that if you support what we do here, make sure to go over to giftedperformance.com and sign up for our automated coaching service. For only a dollar a day, you'll get access to 15 highly customized training programs, a macronutrient calculator, our meal planning feature that lets you build and save meals based on your macros, as well as access to our private Facebook group. All subscriptions help us in continuing to put out great content to get you to your fitness goals. Thanks for stopping by, and without any further delay, let's get into today's video. Enjoy. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Gifted Performance Podcast. Two faces on the top. I don't know how Skype is going to record this, but maybe they'll be on the top. Maybe on the, they'll be on the bottom. Who knows? Cameron and Paul. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, man. Fabulous. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of dandruff breakout. Cam, how you feeling? Good, man. Doing Your background looks great. And a brand new face and name to the podcast, but someone that you should already be familiar with if you are fitness woke is mr jack rayner jack how you doing good morning guys how are we i've never thought about it but jack rayner is a badass fucking name it's like some serious like, like you go around at night just beating the fuck out of thugs like yeah, he sounds like a, a dang like hit man yeah, yeah have so you ever I thought am. about a have you thought about a career of vigilante justice um uh i i am <laughs> But I can't really tell you too much about the job. That's what I figure. That's what I figure. All right, so Jack's coming on today. We're just going to be talking about a whole swath of topics, fat loss phases, mass gaining phases. Um, I know Jack's super looking forward to the most important topic, which is shoes, but we'll save that one for last. So first, I want to give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself to the people, give them the whole rundown on who is Jack Rayner, kind of an education certification, maybe competitive history, bodybuilding, weight training history, as well as kind of what you do for a day job, because you do, unlike some, do something outside of the fitness space. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, cool story about the the, the Jack Rayner <laughs> name as well is that um, everyone on Instagram, because my name is uh Rainy Trainer on Instagram. Everyone thinks I'm called Ryan, um, but yeah, <laughs> That'd be a great name for you. Exactly. Yeah. But um, so yeah. Hello. Um, it is me, Jack. Um, but basically, yeah, I started uh, lifting in around. So it's nearly eleven years now. Damn. Yeah, eleven years ago, uh, and I basically started because um, I was small. <laughs> And it hasn't really changed, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like 11 years of just wasted time. But now, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> um, kind of from the educational background, I kind of... Um, I have a full-time job, which is a, a CNC uh, machinist. So basically, I make cool stuff out of metal, um, whatever it is. We make mainly stuff in the agricultural field, um but yeah it's it's okay um the job kind of allows me to do uh both kind of what i do uh so cnc machining and obviously online coaching on the side uh which is pretty cool so whilst the machine's running i can kind of um reply to clients and program with clients etc so uh kind of allows both which is yeah which is really cool um certifications i did when i was uh kind of at uh with my full-time job so i kind of did that on the side as well um so i basically just did a pt course which is um i'm not too sure what you guys are like over there but it's um it's not too great over here it's just very much uh here's like here's a picture of a body name the parts not really anything to do with high like, hypertrophy or anything like that so um in terms of the education for like formal education that's it i've got uh the level two and level three um i was thinking about doing the level four but because of the level two and the level three i just thought no um so basically um i'm more of a um 
I learn a lot via like listening and kind of the audio side of things. Uh, so I used to listen to lots and lots of podcasts. And, and recently what I've been doing is at work, just going on to kind of membership sites, um, things like RP plus and um, kind of uh, the Re uh, Revive Strong has got one now. Uh, the Muscle Mentors have got one now as well. So uh, basically I just learn off that uh, pretty much all day. I think it's nice to have kind of a selection of people rather than just having one kind of voice in your ear. Uh, maybe we can go into it a bit later, but if you have like one voice in your ear all the time, you kind of believe that philosophy more than anything else and you just think that's just kind of the ghetto gospel. Uh, but obviously there's there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, but yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I don't know if I've missed anything. No, nah, you did a great job there. In the UK scene, maybe maybe I'm biased because I'm not in it. I feel like there's one name that really stands out in kind of the UK bodybuilding scene. That's obviously Jordan Peters, trained by JP. Um, and I, I, what you're talking about with people only having one voice in their ear, I, I see a lot of kind of, I guess we'll call them his fanboys that just have his training mentality. Is that kind of, am, am I accurate there? Or is that just like, maybe I'm just seeing that very loud minority? Um, uh, <laughs> it, um, yeah, maybe. I'll, I'll probably not comment too much on that. Um, maybe. I, but, yeah. Maybe. I know someone's just going to like screen record it and then, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think like anything, I think, like, yeah, I'll, I'll probably just say what I said kind of back there that, yeah, I think people need to see other sides of things to have like kind of a, you kind of pick different things off different people. Like, um, that's one thing that I used to like with, with podcasts, like kind of interviewing people with podcasts is that you kind of interview people and then you get like this, such a, a different opinion. And you can kind of take that opinion and take these different opinions. Like I interviewed kind of Paul and we were talking about certain things and I took things away from that podcast. And then I interviewed like Jeff Alberts and I'm like, okay, cool. That's, that's kind of cool. And then you kind of have this kind of, um, kind of mindset, not just kind of a one track mind. Like this is it. This is the way to do things. It's, um, but yeah, I won't comment too, too much on Jordan Peters. He's done. He's done from there. Mm. No, and I think, uh, there's a lot of really good insight there because I just know for me in terms of programming, having, you know, looking at, you know, people within powerlifting and like looking at various people that do bodybuilding programming and just taking all these sources and almost creating like your own style. Like that's where you become kind of more innovative and you think outside of just like your one little box, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So as we kind of move along here, uh, your training history, you said you started because you were skinny. You said you stayed skinny. I disagree. Your arms are looking absolutely beefy. You're punishing the sleeves on those tea, on that tee right now. Um, when you first started out, were you playing any sports alongside of your resistance training or has it kind of just been resistance training for the goal of hypertrophy from day one until here we are today? Yeah, sure. I mean, on the uh, on the arm comment, uh, a little a little pro tip is to wear t-shirts that are like four times too small for you, and oh, then yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not wearing a then... shirt. I'm wearing a sports bra. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like that, to be fair. Um, so yeah, no, I I used to play um, so um, soccer in America football in the uk um but yeah i used to play um football since i was probably around like five or six um and that the reason why i actually stopped that and i i played it until i was around 22 to 23 uh, so i stopped it around three years ago um i went through a significant fat loss phase and i had i was playing quite at quite a competitive level um and yeah doing having a kind of a really bad or really harsh deficit um especially like week like 20 to 30 you know how that feels playing that like four times a week uh football as well it kind of just kicked me to the like kicked me into the ground so actually since then i haven't watched a single game of football like at all <laughs> so i think it's, it's just like kind of scarred in my memory but yeah i used to play uh competitive competitive sports 
um, for a while. Um, yeah, I, there, there's thoughts of going back just purely because I just kind of like the competitive side of things. Um, I also like like kicking. Can we swear on this podcast? Absolutely. <laughs> Dropped at least <laughs> six, eight, six <laughs> I love just kicking the shit out of people sometimes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you kind of get like maybe like three or four game ban, and then like you're you're rejuvenated, so you know and then you can you fit a meta cycle in there. Then active rest, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, no. So that's my competitive. I I don't really um I don't really play anything else. Unfortunately, it's football, and that's it, or it used to be at least. Now with your client side of things, um. You work with mainly general population, competitors, athletes, a healthy mixture of all of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for the most part, I would say like 90% are like kind of gen pop or or deemed gen pop. Um, And there is a a massive difference between kind of coaching a competitor to gen pop. Like I feel like the the difference is mainly like the hugging side of things and like kind of the nurturing side of things. So, um, with a competitor, you can kind of say, right, here you go. Here's, here's what to do this week. And they kind of like, like, yes, sir. Uh, And then come back next week and check in exactly on time. And, uh, and then they've kind of, they've, they've done that week, not all, but some, uh, whereas just for the, the gem pop kind of clients, you get some who maybe are like, oh, fuck, I ate, I ate a whole cheesecake. And then you kind of have to hug them and like pat them on the back. And it's like, it's okay. <laughs> everything will be okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's definitely kind of, you have a like an individual kind of uh, approach to everybody. Um, the difference between them two is, is, is crazy. I'm sure you, you guys are tired. Do you ever get tired of giving out hugs? I ran out of hugs probably like two years. I've been doing this for like five years. I ran out of all hugs. I got none left. Yeah. I was, yeah. Um, I think that, um, and this is, I wouldn't say this is one of the reasons why I wanted to compete, um, but I did want to compete to, to be in that kind of field. Um, I've always wanted to compete, just never really thought I was big enough to compete. I think that's, that kind of goes with everybody. Like, I, I think for the most part, if you haven't competed and you've been training for like 10, 20 years, whatever, um, I just think that everybody's got that I'm too small mentality. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like, I just kind of thought, what the hell? And I kind of wanted to drive clients to the competitive scene or not drive clients, kind of um, attract clients from that scene. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that I'm not done giving hugs. But I'm um, close to being done giving hugs. <laughs> it's crazy because people act like, oh, if you've never competed before, there's no way that you can coach a competitor. And it's like, uh, I don't know where that rule really applies. Like, maybe it gives a better understanding, especially towards the end of things. But it's a little too jumpy to conclusion. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but as it, I said, it definitely. Uh, happens though it definitely attracts them Mm -hmm. yeah for sure i think that like if you kind of direct content in that way where you kind of you direct direct kind of instagram content to the physique athlete i think that you're you're generally gonna get kind of that niche um which is which is what's happened so that's cool so Cam is Cam is kind of our designated babier. He takes all the babying of the clients and brings them along. We recently had a client that the three of us are all working together. He will remain unnamed, but he's going to watch this. He's going to know we're talking about him. I do his training. Paul does uh, his, his supplemental side of things. And then Cam does his nutrition. And we found out that he just finished up his, what was it, four or five month massing phase. And he's never used my fitness pal before. He was using uh-huh. the back of food labels to do all of his nutrition in camp says, you know what, you know, download my fitness pal. Let's kind of just see what you're eating. And then he sent us his three meals of the day that were, what, what, was, what were his meals? It was like a protein uh, shake, okay. 1600. <laughs> his only protein sources way. He had, he had three, he had three shakes. Meals. He had like four <laughs> meals that day. The first meal was like normal, I think. And then the other three meals were, Two giant oatmeal cream pies and two scoops of whey protein. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I'm texting Cam in the side group chat, and I'm like, Cam, you gotta, you gotta whip him into shape. You gotta, you gotta get this man in shape. And Cam's like, Hey, man, like I love you, and I know you're doing your best, but like, <laughs> try to eat a fruit every once in a while, dummy. Dude, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because I'm younger. I don't look as scary as Paul. But like, if someone doesn't send photos that morning, or they're like, "I'm gonna get them the next morning," like they always will text me separately because Paul and I co-coach a lot of our athletes together, and they always come just only to me. Like, hey, don't tell Paul, <laughs> but I'm gonna update you tomorrow because I, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Every time I just screenshot, send it in the group message with Paul. <laughs> Please update both of us. <laughs> see, see, Ryan. Ryan said you, you said uh, you run out of hugs, but realistically, you just passed. You passed the talk. I have, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> it's all about delegation. All what about delegating. What was but that? Jack, I would or like. Hear, I'll get texted would... at like 10 p.m. Hey, I didn't want to text Paul this late, but do you think I'm like? Oh, I guess I'm like five hours behind. I'm in a whole different time zone than Paul is. It's like, <laughs> sure, don't wake Paul up at 10 p.m., but wake me up. <laughs> Yeah, Paul doesn't like anything past seven o'clock. <laughs> no, dude, I'm cool with it, man. No, I'm you're not. Sad. You're a liar. You are such <laughs> a liar. It's just like girlfriend comes home from work at like six, man, and so sometimes people just want to text to text, and I'm like, I I can't have my phone blowing up till 10 p.m. about nothing. So I just I just gotta filter it out a little bit so I can get to the important stuff. It's just you me have, um, sending nudes to Paul to get him in trouble with Christina. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Do you have like a um um what do you call it? Like the app you can turn the app notifications off a per, like past a certain time. I know you can do it on the iPhone. Yeah. Uh, but that might be worth doing. That's something that I do. So anything past like uh, my cutoff points like nine o'clock. If I have like an app notification at nine o'clock, like I don't see it, so it don't do get responded do, uh, to. When you're communicating with your clientele, do you do things through a special app that messages? Because I think that might be something neat looking into, Paul. Because we just do like regular iMessage app, like we communicate with anybody in our personal life, which is, I guess, them now. <laughs> yeah. No, I have. Um, I just have WhatsApp. Uh, but what I do with WhatsApp is um, I'll just put kind of um, like client and then the name. So like if it pops up, I know it's like it just says client and then the name. Uh, so if it says like obviously if it says like Nat, I know oh Nat's my wife. So I got to text her back. You know I was I went shit. <laughs> Jack, I would actually like to hear kind of your process when you are bringing on someone new. So let's assume it's like a general population Gen Fitness style client and they are trying to get into a fat loss phase. You're someone who does more of the hugging, bringing along the education, which is really good. People like that in the industry are are few and far between, and we need more of them. But how much like education and bringing up to speed are you doing on the front end? Maybe just walk me through what you do with someone who's brand new to the process. Yeah, so for the most part, um, I try to steer clear of someone who's completely new to the gym. Um, I think if you're completely new to the gym and you just yeah you're just kind of fresh off the runway then i think that you're kind of better off going to a one-to-one -one personal trainer first and due to me having a job i can't do one-to-one -one as much um so i would highly advise for someone to do that first um if they've had some sort of or, or at least getting kind of taught movement patterns at least um just being comfortable with a barbell um otherwise i'm going to be programming like back squats into deadlifts like supersets you know uh and just see how they cope with it but um but yeah from from a kind of setting up standpoint um if so are we saying like uh if the goal is a fat loss phase or or just in general well so we'll start with a fat loss phase okay so yeah if the goal is a kind of a fat loss phase one thing that like if they have pre like um kind of uh data from what they're doing now and uh, that's kind of ideal i don't take too much consideration into what they've already done um for some coaches like if they've come from one coach to kind of me um like uh how do i say this it's like some okay some of them could be crap right so you kind of they come on board with you and they've kind of got them on like 800 calories and they're kind of losing weight it's like well yeah cool like anyone could kind of do that. Uh, so I kind of almost kind of look at the data that they're kind of giving me, but 
also kind of neglect it a little bit. Um, so what I tend to do with someone in a fat loss phase obviously depends on their scenario. Like if they've come straight from a mass, if they come from a kind of maintenance phase or, or whatever, uh, we tend to have like a, a period of maybe one to two weeks of just establishing where maintenance is. Um, and then we can go from there really. Um, but yeah, it, it often depends on kind of their expertise as well. Like if they're kind of um, like a, a regimented kind of competitor, they know exactly what they put in their mouth, everything else like that. We can kind of off the bat just go, right, okay, um, you've not had a period of low maintenance for a while, maybe worth doing that. Um, kind of, it, it kind of very, very much depends. And that's kind of where my clientele, like I have kind of gem pop and kind of competitors. So the kind of individuality of, who I have kind of depends on the steps that I take. It kind of the same with you guys probably. Yeah, I think uh, I think ultimately it's always neat hearing uh, like people's. I know you didn't get into specifics, but a lot of good stuff there. But like, uh, shit, I lost my train of thought. I got a train of thought ready. <laughs> when you do calculate someone's new maintenance, how are you going about that? Are you looking at the previous data and how fast they were losing weight? Are you using a formula? Are you rolling your face on the keyboard and just coming up with a number? How are you doing it? Option three? Um, mainly the latter, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's normally always one, two, three, four. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, no, so normally um i would kind of look at yeah look at pre-existing data if they have it kind of see where they're going like if they're kind of losing at a significant like like kind of losing like three percent uh, of their body weight per week you think well okay we've probably got like a thousand calorie deficit here so you just kind of bump them up um nine times out of ten the the kind of it's all because it's almost like a guess at the start it's almost you you can almost never like it's very rare for you just to have like here's your maintenance and then all of a sudden they're just kind of leveling leveling out there's almost always some sort of kind of irregularity like um again maybe they're not tracking food properly um maybe you kind of tighten up that up a little bit maybe you look towards something more so like a meal plan um i don't necessarily like meal plans but i think meal plans do have their place um especially for someone who does isn't that experience with kind of my fitness pal um so yeah normally with the the calculate like kind of calculating side of things um i just find that a kind of a i wouldn't say a, a general calorie calculator is that great um i would normally kind of do something like a um i would normally say calories obviously depending on the situation obviously um if they're active, if they've got like a kind of a full-time job, for example, someone with an office job is going to be completely different to someone who's who's kind of a laborer and everything else like that. So, um, yeah, I would normally say kind of like the times like 14 uh, would be around maintenance, maybe lower than that actually, uh, obviously depending on the situation. But, yeah, um, for the most part, I kind of look at their data and then adjust from there. Yeah. I like that you brought up that everything, you know, more or less is a guess. And there's some guesses are better than others. And, you know, some processes of starting a client, you know, I don't want to say there's not a wrong way because there are certain things like if somebody was like, OK, we're just going to start you off at 10 calories per pound of body weight. You'd be like, eh, I don't know if we should do that, you know, but mm -hmm. ultimately at the end of the day, it's about collecting some data and then making the uh, best moves you can from there. Right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people sure. are when when talking about bringing on clients, they're almost afraid to sound too cookie cutter, you know, mm -hmm. and like, oh, I, I just do uh, this one number times their body weight and I start there. But I mean, fuck it, you know, start where you start and it's all about where you go from there. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a yep. very general guess or it's an elegant guess. They're both guesses. So at the end of the day, you're basically just, you know, making that starting number assessing the data from that starting point and then just taking it from there. That's where the coaching actually goes into it. I think a lot of people think that the coaching is having the fancy spreadsheets, having the fancy calculators, having all these things where you can input all this data, but that's not really, 
the coaching, that's really just the starting point in the data collection. The coaching is how you make manipulations from there. I think yeah, for sure. I heard you say too, Ryan, it's almost like if you get too much into the fancy stuff, you're almost trying to take the coaching out of the coaching. Like, how do I not think about this at all? You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that you can become like way too like systematic with, with things like that. You can, it, yeah, almost, uh, that's, a, that's a cool way of putting it. You kind of take the coaching out of coaching and like with the, with the, with the calorie stuff, we can almost, ne well, not neglect, but uh, like look at the data for the kind of uh, the first two weeks and then think, hmm, like if you, if you see on the first week that <laughs> the, the, it, you're kind of gaining like 4% of body weight and you're meant to be losing weight or you're meant to be at maintenance, then you could kind of dial it back. But for the most part, I kind of don't touch too much for the first two weeks. So, um, but yeah, I think that some coach coaching styles, you can just become way too systematic. It's almost like a cookie cutter plan uh, with some. I think if you try and automate too much of it, you 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 you've just completely taken all the. I love the the. This is automated. You know, like the automated macro coaching it's like these are it's just a bunch mm. of if then formulas in an excel spreadsheet onto an app and then when your weight goes up when your weight goes down the app isn't going to tell you anything other than what it understands and what it understands is that you're not losing weight we need to cut calories very drastically and i've heard a lot of horror stories from the rp app in terms of and maybe they've made some modifications to it in terms of like someone maintained for a week and it ends up cutting 200 grams of their carbohydrates to keep them back on <laughs> their track of losing two pounds per week. But um, when, in your practice with your most successful clients, what are some of the biggest boxes that they're checking that allows them to be successful? Is it the physical activity like you mentioned? Is it making smart food choices? Is it being extremely diligent in their tracking? What do you attribute the most success to? So most, like I would say like the most successful kind of athletes that I've coached have always, 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 no, yeah, kind of, uh, they are almost, I wouldn't say the words relax, but almost kind of really kind of relax in that approach where um, they know, we, we kind of teach them about overload, we teach them about kind of everything to do with that. I think once you understand the mechanisms behind kind of overload and kind of calories in calories out and everything else like that you can almost like look at the data and say for example they have a day where they're eating cheesecake all day and everything else like that you can almost like go right okay they're kind of experienced enough to just hop back onto the horse and then just continue on their fat loss phase rather than having like six days eating like crap um and i feel like yeah for, for the most part i feel like the clients who kind of check in on time i find the people who um who have not almost consistent communication but very much kind of ask questions i think I, i'd prefer someone to ask me too many questions than not any questions at all like for some clients you have like they kind of check in and then all of a sudden the next kind of form of communication you have is the check-in again you're like all of a sudden you've got the check-in back and you're like oh okay like kind of what's going on here but i almost prefer like someone to kind of like message me saying is this okay for form how's my kind of intensity in in this um and everything else like that so uh in terms of the the neat side of things i i don't mind kind of the 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 tracking of steps etc i find that you can get a little bit kind of anal about it you can like if you're i don't know you're out with friends all day and you need to get to like 10,000 steps and you've hit like seven i think you'll be okay like i think again that, that's almost like the relaxed approach so i do find for the most part with people who are in a fat loss phase i think that a more relaxed approach is is nine times out of ten better than like a really regimented you have to hit everything to the t um of course for like contest prep you probably might benefit a little bit from being a little bit kind of switched on like i i um I almost have like a dial. Uh, so when you're in terms or times of kind of high stress, uh, you can obviously switch the dial down and become a little bit more relaxed. 
uh, with a fat loss phase, you can kind of get away with one or two hundred calories either side. And when you're in like a contest prep and like low, well, it's not necessarily low stress in a, in a contest prep, but when you're kind of in a contest prep or in a low stress kind of environment, you can kind of have that kind of like five to 10 grams um, either side of your macros. For sure. Is that some freedom that, that, that you would agree with, Cam? Yeah, yeah, usually. I, I like to tell people, um, you know, obviously try and be as perfect to your targets as possible. But I think, you know, being within, you know, maybe a five gram range of protein and carbs, and especially as it gets closer to um, maybe around three gram range with fats, but usually just tell everyone, you know, at the start of a prep, maybe like 20 weeks out to 12 to 10 weeks out, I try and tell everybody, you know, Make sure your protein uh, average on the week is within a 5 to 10 gram range of your target. And then I like to see weekly caloric intake in a plus or minus 100 calorie range. I like I like the example of the dial because I think that in those high stress situations, dialing it or pulling the dial back is is definitely a good idea. You keep the dial super high or super stressed out, you end up blowing the light bulb and these people just go full fuck it mode. And like you said, they, they eat an entire cheesecake and they text you the next morning and they're crying and they, oh, I blew it all up. I did terrible. I can't work with you anymore. I've canceled my payment. Um, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to train for it to be on an episode of my 600 pound life. So people can go very off the rails if you try and hold them too tight for too long, especially for like your, your general fitness clientele. But as you as you kind of move someone from fat loss mode into all right, we got all the fat off, we're feeling good about the physique. Now they want to get into everyone's favorite term, the lean gaining phase. What are some of the steps that you use to transition into that lean gaining phase? Do you pull steps down, slowly bring food up? What do you do with cardio, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I definitely kind of as much as I can. Um, and again, individual de- like dependent. I think you'll hear me say that a lot on this podcast. But individual dependent. If if you can get away with as as little amount of cardio as possible, especially in a kind of uh, a massing phase, I think your your performance is going to be pretty damn good. Um, I feel like if you're kind of let's just say for example, you're on like an hour um, hour a day kind of cardio at the end of a fat loss phase, and you start that into a massing phase, I think you're pulling a little bit from your performance. Um, I think that it also depends on how lean you've you've kind of gotten or got. Um, I think if you're kind of the stage lean, you won't want to kind of stay in that period of maintenance and then push up. I think you just want to get out of there. Um, I think if you're kind of maybe like the the 10 to like 12 percent body fat which uh we can argue all day about how you measure that but uh, i think from <laughs> from photos you can probably just about tell um uh, i think you're about i think if you're, if you're in that range you could probably you may be able to benefit from like a little kind of maintenance phase and then push up um but yeah i definitely i definitely feel like if you're kind of very lean get out of there very quickly not necessarily like a uh, I wouldn't say it would be like a, a rebound. I would say that it would be probably more like a like a, a reverse diet, uh, yeah. but just just reasonably quick at the start, and then obviously taper back a little bit, maybe to like the kind of 0.25. I like I like 0.25 to 0.75. It's a very it's quite a big target to stay in between. But I think for the most part, if you go underneath that 0.25 percent. Uh, of massing i think you're kind of spinning your wheels a little bit i think if you go over the 0.75 i think you're pushing it quite hard i think if you're in the kind of fluffy range i think that 0.75 is quite harsh as well um so if you're reasonably fluffy let's just say for example maybe like that 18 to 20 percent body fat um i think that you could probably benefit from like the 0.25 to 0.5 percent uh rate of gain um but yeah massing phase bitches I liked what you said about coming out of the diet about sometimes that first little bit go ahead and bring in that weight up some um, and that's yeah. something that I've really enjoyed um, doing with some of my clients especially um, at a natural athlete post show and um, you know he, we wanted to take a slow reverse approach from the start and uh, we did and 
I I'd had an idea. It probably wasn't the best of ideas. And, you know, he started showing all those signs of low testosterone coming out of the diet. And so I immediately just set him to what was an estimated maintenance of about you know, five to seven pounds heavier than there and bumped that food up and his weight went up and he was just maintaining there and felt 10 times better and yep. mentally was just a whole lot better. I don't, I, a lot of people too will think, you know, just because post diet, you can reverse diet perfectly fine, stay super lean and just getting your food up is going to take care of a lot of the issues. But in reality, you can get your food up as high as you want. If you're, you know, sub 8% body fat, you're going to feel like shit, whether you're maintaining on a thousand calories or 5,000 calories a day. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah. yeah. It's one of those I feel like if you kind of, if you, if you're like, if you're pressed down for that long, for example, like if you're kind of dieting for like 40 weeks and then you're being told to still be on kind of low calories, you're almost going to like rebel against it. And then again, like, like you've just had kind of the 40 weeks of just thinking about food all the time and then all of a sudden you've had your show or you are kind of you've had your photo shoot or whatever it is and then all of a sudden you're like right I'm done and then it's kind of like what's the point I'm not uh, there's no goal the goal's kind of been passed um and now you're eating like 300 calories above what you were <laughs> originally so I, yeah I like to tell uh clients you know post diet Pretend and go ahead and mentally prepare yourself that your diet's not over for another four to six weeks. And whenever there's a show involved, I feel that's a, a little bit harder to do because all the post-show celebrations and, you know, everyone that you know is bringing you food. But especially with just, you know, regular fat loss phase, I think it's a lot easier for someone to do that and mentally get there. One, they don't have to get as lean either. So that yeah. plays a factor. But um yeah, just telling people, you know, it's it, the diet's really not not over yet. Um, no. And just kind of is, letting people sit the mindset of, I, I tell people like gain taining pretty much. Like you want your average to stay the same. And I do too, so I can bump your food up and eventually your weight's going to come up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this, I think that's one of those questions. There's just so much to consider, right? Like, you know, if you have a client who – has had multiple binges over the past couple months you're like eh, maybe slow reverse isn't for you or the end of the diet's coming up and you're like okay we're gonna start reversing you they're like can i have a cheat meal now and you're just like yeah. uh 10 calorie challenge <laughs> what i've actually had a good amount of success with with clients coming out of, of contest prep is because these individuals are very regimented, they like having numbers, they like having to shoot for something or having something to shoot for, is I'll tell them, listen, in this first month post show, for you to have a good off season, I need you to gain five to 10% of your body weight. So it's putting something in their mind of like, all right, I have a new goal to shoot for. It requires eating a dish. It requires eating additional foods. And then when they're up seven, eight percent of their body weight post show after a month, they come to you and they say, coach, I did good. They feel like they're successful. Whereas if you don't set that goal, they come to you and they say, oh, my God, I'm already up eight pounds. I'm already up 10 pounds. I've completely failed. But you've just kind of shifted that mindset of giving them a goal to achieve. So they feel like they've, they've, they've done something good or they've, they've succeeded. And I have to give a shout out to Alberto Nunez and, and Jeff Alberts. That's kind of the numbers that they throw on their recovery diet. So I see with that, like five to 10 percent hormones start to come back. Hunger starts to drop off. Sex drive comes back. So they're starting to feel a little bit better as well. Another thing that's uh, super neat is I, I usually will have everyone just track their macros year round outside of like the last six to eight weeks leading into a show. And that post show mark, switching them back from a meal plan to tracking macros, I, I feel has really kind of opened their minds up to feel like, oh, you know, my food might not be crazy higher, but I have so much variance to do what I want. I get to eat more foods, a variety, not say as restricted. More and that's been pretty nice. Nice. Huh? More oh, yeah. nice. Right. I actually think I'm going to oppose what you say there, Cam. I actually think that might be somewhat of a recipe for disaster coming off of a meal plan. And now you open up the kind of like open up all the categories of food and they can have whatever they want. And they feel like they want to fit in the oatmeal cream pies or the 600 or 1600 calories worth of pasta. And they can and then they just com the rails are just completely blown off. That's true. That's a good argument for sure. I guess it kind of comes down 
to the athlete really because you know someone that's been doing it and like time and time again is gonna know not to do some dumb stuff like that but maybe someone that's a first-time competitor instead you give them like three out of their five meals on the meal plan and then just free calories Cam, you'd be terrible in politics. This is the point. When someone encounters your point, the next thing that you do is attack their character. You say, <laughs> I hear your point. It's stupid because you're stupid. You're a piece of shit. And now let's move on with the debate. Or so I, practice, <laughs> or you just redirect the that Jack. One. You just make Jack feel like shit. Like <laughs> <laughs> let's get back to Jack. What's our, what's our next topic? So Jack, something I actually did, I actually I did want to compliment you on is, and I think that it goes underappreciated on your page, and I'm not 100% sure why we'll blame like the algorithm or something, is that you produce a lot of really, really good content that is kind of brought down and it's very concise and it gets a very clear message a lot. It's not these like huge graphs with all this data and whatnot. It's here's the point, here's the takeaway, here's how you apply it. Um, just from your standpoint, is that something, because I think a lot of coaches want to get to that point where they're producing good content like that. Is that something that you've always been good at? You've had to develop and do you see a lot of conversion from producing really good content to bringing on clients? Yeah, I think the, um, I, I'm not going to blame it on the reduced algorithm. I think it's just the fact that people just don't like massive ginger beards. Uh, I think there's a massive <laughs> contributor to that. Um, but, um, <laughs> In terms of like the the content scenario, like I think I had an Instagram account when pretty much when it was just like it started. Um, so like when if you scroll back through my Instagram, uh, do you know the rapper the game? So yeah. You did like yeah. how we do. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So I so if you scroll right to the bottom of my um, so my running trainer page, my uh, page used to be a game like fan page. So like back in the day, it was like a fan page. And I used to, the, the very um, uh, app that I use, Canva, I used to use Canva to like write down all of, all of his lyrics on this like little infographic thing. So if you look way, like way back then, then that's when I was kind of doing all of this stuff. So and most of my, uh, most of my following is actually still game fans. They just kind of like look at all my stuff still. But um, so then maybe that's kind of contributed to the, the lack of, um i suppose it would be likes and engagement etc so um do you ever but get for email? the mail do people ever hit you up and they're just like hey man you've changed what happened <laughs> to the game content <laughs> um a little bit actually not not too much now like uh, i mean i i changed over around 2000 or maybe like 15 so yeah, not, not like definitely at the start. They're like, dude, where's all the game content? Like, where where is where is the lyrics to <laughs> how we do? Have you ever reached out to the game yeah, and asked him if he needs an online coach? Um, yeah. So that's a fun <laughs> fun story actually. Um, so <laughs> I actually Jack is full of that. yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like stuff you ask and like no way. Well, to be honest, <laughs> let's hear it. Um, so yeah, um, when uh, so when the game used to come to the UK, we used to basically uh, there was a group of us, probably like four or five of us, and we used to basically tour the the UK. So we used to go into his little tour bus, and we used to just go into different venues and everything else like that. So um, I was like a I was what they called back in the day a groupie. Um, I was like yeah, go go game. Um, so yeah, um, my and, image yeah. of what a groupie is like it's just yeah, that just fucked it up for me. No, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I'd like my top off, and I was like, game. <laughs> lick, lick, lick my my <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So, um, that's why I have hardly any topless photos on Instagram because I have like, I love game written across my chest. <laughs> um, but no, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I used to get, I got into fitness and everything else like that. So I had did my PT qualification and stuff, and I kind of just. Like we were just talking and they were quite into the into the gym so they kind of um we used to go to like liverpool and manchester and stuff and we used, used to kind of hit up a gym for a couple of hours and then get back into the tour bus and then kind of go on stage and stuff um so i used to coach uh, one of my first clients ever uh, was the game's brother um so 
that's kind of how I yeah it's kind of how I started properly really um he, he would kind of put something on his instagram like i'm getting coached by this guy then all of a sudden i had like the, the the kind of turnover from that um so my most of my um clients have always been through instagram um not necessarily twitter or facebook um facebook i tend to find is, is more, more times out of 10 is full of like 64 five year old like karen types arguing with the manager them types um and twitter i haven't really ever been on but yeah most of my turnover with clients has always been through like my content um kind of my message and not everything on instagram is like uh, is the content side of things it's, it's kind of what i try and tell people um that most of like people will always resonate with you like not all, not not everyone, but some people will always kind of re- resonate with you. You kind of then you look at their page, you're like, oh, I can kind of relate to this guy a little bit. So I always try and show like like I consider myself a bit of a dick. Like if like I <laughs> I try and put that that on Instagram as much as possible. So um, I I tend to find that if you have like the content layout, I tend to find if you if you if I at least have kind of something knowledgeable like once per day it doesn't have to be anything major if you have kind of something once per day um alongside a bit of your kind of character i feel like the the kind of client rate coming in is pretty is pretty cool that's huge man and it's something i've sort of realized too is just how much people you know appreciate personality and like feeling like they know you a little more and like to the point where, you know, I think I did a Q&A like a few weeks ago or a month ago or something. And it was more personal stuff than anything fitness related. And, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. You're so, uh, you, you should do way, way, way more Q&As. <laughs> and they're literally the funniest things. Oh, even my mom. I'll like whenever I go and see her, she'll talk about Paul's Q and A's. Like, <laughs> just talk about how she's like, "Did you see that one where some lady was asking him for help to carry something, and he was just like, no, go fuck yourself. Do you have any dumbbells I can have?'" Like, she thinks they're hilarious. I would, but those days I get nothing done. <laughs> Got to dedicate one day to it. I know, right? Yeah, for sure. But yeah, Jack. Jack, you say you are a dick, but I, 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 don't, I don't really see you as a dick. I think there's, I think there's a lot dickier. We'll go, we'll go with that. Dickier individuals, and in that, and they kind of are constantly myth busting, passive aggressively attacking each other on Instagram. And I think Paul has mentioned in the past that he has kind of gone down that route, and I've definitely gone down Dude, that I'm route before. Still passive oh, aggressive. I don't know how to fix it. I think it's just like a fucked up character. For I don't me. even. Th- Paul's not passive aggressive. He's aggressive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> but do you? Do you? As someone who puts out a good amount of content, do you see that as something that's? I just want to get your opinion on this. As something that's helpful is like. So let's say I make a post about like BCAAs and I'm like, look at this dumb motherfucker over here. What an idiot taking BCAAs. Like, do you find that to be helpful or more of a turnoff for people who are maybe less initiated in the fitness field? Yeah. So I went through a stage of like completely ripping into like fitness influencers. And I kind of got to the stage where I was just like, what the hell is this doing for my business like it's it's really not doing that much um and although it could help it this is the thing it depends what you want to do it for because if you're looking for like the like clientele if you're looking for people like new people to come on board um it's probably not going to do that what it might do is kind of open up a few because i feel like for the most part like fitness influencers are always gunning for like young females so if i could like if someone's viewing my content and they're a young female theirself and they see that I, I'm saying like a good, a good one right now is that, uh, this is Gemma Collins. She's doing a kind of, uh, skinny jab. It's kind of a, a jab that you kind of inject yourself and it kind of makes you skinny. I, I don't know the mechanism behind it, but, uh, I kind of put cool bullshit on it. Um, and if it can kind of stop a young girl doing, go, like going down that route, 
then I find it to be helpful, but not necessarily like they're not, they might not come on board with you for that reason. I can't, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but being kind of the passive aggressive, um, I am, I'm kind of the same, especially when the whole kind of like the training to failure versus RER thing like kicked off. Um, I found myself in, in and amongst that kind of thing, even though I'm not really an advocate for one or the other, it like, I'm not on like, you must train with RER, you must train to failure. I'll be like, right, okay, well, what's this individual? How do they like to train? What's their personality like, etc. And then go from there. Um, but I feel like I had to defend kind of the RER thing because everyone was being passive aggressive to that. And then when I realized I was being passive aggressive back and it, it wasn't really solving anything, then I just kind of just step away. Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly that pressure to kind of join one camp or the other. It's like they see you kind of maybe talking with with Isertel or with Steve Hall, and they're like, oh, Jack, he, he must be of the RIR clan. Or maybe you have a conversation with, you know, uh, someone who follows DC-style training or someone like uh, trained by JP, Jordan Peters, that more is on the side of failure. And they're like, oh, you know, he... He must have joined that camp when in actuality you're like, hey, listen, like there's there's an application for both of these things. Let's let's use them yeah. both wisely. Like, why do we have to pick one or the other? It's like yeah, that's kind of why. A lot... I'm... Go ahead. I so said that's kind of why I'm I'm actually doing kind of a both both training style. This is probably a little bit off topic, but I am actually going. Uh, I'm training to failure, but I'm also incorporating reps and reserve into it as well. So what I basically am doing is just having kind of, like you say, if I have three sets, I'm kind of going with uh, like the first set of maybe like two RER, the first set of one RER, then the first, like the last set kind of balls to the wall. And it's kind of like showing people that you don't have to be like that, and like reps and reserve or training to failure. You can kind of, you can do both. So it's yeah. kind of what I'm trialing right now myself. And it's something that I always try and say to people is that, like if I ever like let's just say for example someone trained to failure then they go to reps and reserve um if you don't like that and you've just wasted one mesocycle or one training block then it's really not the end of the world like one training block or one two training block comparatively to like relative to your whole training career is really like a blip it's like a, a drip in the ocean it's, it's really nothing so you really haven't got much to lose when like kind of trying different things and again like we spoke about previously you kind of take different things from different people it's not always like you take things from this guy and you have to train this way and you have to eat this way it's always like you just kind of grab everything away you can yeah how oh. 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 um fuck you cam so yeah no <laughs> no the uh the <laughs> What the whole passive aggressive thing, um, sort of what I've seen too is like, you know, it, it's fun and it's emotional, but like that's sort of the problem with it is like you're you're not winning the heart of anybody on the other side by like taking jabs to them. Um and you know, people who have already bought in, they're like the people who are most likely to reach out, you know, based off that post. And they were already, they've already bought in. Right. Um, and then another issue I've sort of seen is like, yeah, it's one thing if you're shitting on like a popular fitness influencer or big name someplace else. But like, if you like shit too much in your backyard, like you just don't want to be in that position where like locally you have a bunch of enemies now, you know, yeah. or like, you know, you, you should, I, I found in my opinion is just to, Put out the good information and then other people will be more receptive to it. And especially if you're producing results, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. My two cents. But. I'd say it makes people taking that passive aggressive stance makes people kind of dig their heels in a little bit more than it does actually help people. So, for example, if you're, let's say we're shitting on supplementing with like BCAs or something like that, you send out that kind of message into your own echo chamber and then you get the response from all the people who already believe you and they're like, you're the best, you're so smart, you're right. And then there's the other pe the other side of the people who are taking it and they're looking up to the influencers and they're like, well, who is this guy? Who is this small guy? Who is it with, with 3,000 followers or whatever? Like Ronnie Coleman takes this and he's 
the, the biggest man to ever exist. So what the hell does this little guy know? And then you've kind of driven an even bigger rift in between the two camps when in actuality you could have just been like, listen, this stuff is it's, it's all right. You know, here's how it works. Here's who it could maybe work for. And here's who it probably doesn't work for. Speaking of Ronnie Coleman, Jack, I think I saw you post about the Ronnie Coleman, Joe Rogan. Did you enjoy it? I loved it. I loved every second of it. It was hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Uh, I, I, I thought it's a little bit of kind of confirmation bias where I'm kind of like, I, I think he is probably one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time. But fuck, he knows <laughs> jack shit. Dude, did you hear, did you hear the... Oh yeah, on stage I was about 270 pounds and 0.33 percent body fat, and then off season 320 pounds and only three percent body fat. Joe Rogan was like three percent, no way, <laughs> and he was like, yeah. Yeah, he "That's said, enough fat for me." <laughs> yeah, he said uh, he said something like, uh, "I'll." Um... I was a uh, minus two percent at one point, and Joe Rogan was like, "How is that even possible?" I was like, "It's not." <laughs> <laughs> he said, and he said that about the hydrostatic weighing. He's like, "Yeah," he's like, "I got the one where they dipped me in the tank, and it came back all negative numbers." And Joe was just, Joe was just eating it up. Joe was loving yeah. it. You could tell he was having the most fun of his life. Yeah, well, what do you I think? Felt sorry for Ronnie, though. I, I love I I don't know I just love like yeah he's not the smartest but I just I love Ronnie as a person he just seems like just such a genuinely good dude who had so much fun when he was bodybuilding he was living his passion he was loving his life he's talking about after the winning the Olympia how he would go to Pizza Hut and then he would go to the strip club like that's the most wholesome thing ever like this is the like yeah. he's not going out partying and he's hanging out with groupies. You know, he's in the strip like, club. He, he, like you're, you're not like, man, that dude is a fucking dumbass. You're like, ah, he's a little simple, but he's a nice guy. Like yeah. <laughs> a grandpa. Like that's who you want as your grandpa. He sounds comforting. He sounds like he's been through some good life struggles and would understand. But it's gonna be okay. We're gonna there, was make- a, there was a part. Uh, um, there was a part where he said when he was a police officer and he was like, um, that I think uh, Joe asked him something about like kind of have you ever like uh, being in trouble for kind of police brutality and stuff and we I'm not I don't want to go too much into all that stuff right now but uh but he said something about when he was um when he arrested someone he casually just ripped this guy's arm out of his socket I was like what the fuck (laughs) (laughs) who who what kind of crazy individual sees Ronnie Coleman roll, roll up and they're like I'm going to resist arrest. That's, that's the <laughs> move right now. Yeah, that's my best time. plan of action. Probably some yeah. crossfitter that was like, I bet his mobility sucks. I'm more yeah. functional than him. What, what was the crazy part? Arms right out of the sockets. The crazy part to me was whenever uh, Joe Rogan asked him whenever he actually started taking bodybuilding seriously, and he said after he won his first Olympia. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, I just was doing doing it for a free gym membership the rest We're of the just time. Been around before. Jack, I, I wonder how much of that's actually said, true. You think he's one of the best bodybuilders of all time? I'm I'm interested to hear who you think is kind of up there with him because I have I have Ronnie as Michael Jordan status. No one has touched him and probably ever will touch him. Yeah, I would say that he is. I would say he is my my greatest bodybuilder of all time. Um, I would say something like uh, probably Flex. Um. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say Dorian Yates. I don't think. I don't think he's what. I think he, he was great. I don't think he was. He was the, one of the greatest. I don't think. I think that Ronnie has far superior genetics. Um, uh, Phil Heath is is one of them ones up there as well for me. Um, and obviously Jay Jay Cutler. Yeah, I think yeah. I would. I think I would lump just from like a, a just an absolute dominance standpoint. I think I would lump in Lee Haney as well. That's you look about. at a guy who did what eight Olympias and never lost, and then retired. Yeah. I mean, that's the equivalent of you know winning the NBA Finals eight times and then retiring and never being beaten. Yeah. It's just something that is is really quite unheard of. But yeah, if we're just looking at the physique, man, how about a Ronnie Coleman versus Phil Heath, both in their prime Olympia? Yeah. That would be some prime time viewing right there. But we did, and this is where kind of Cam and Paul, you're going to have to kind of take a back seat here. Sorry, guys. But this is the, the big boys are talking now. We were talking about Jordan. Jack is a lover of shoes. I'm a retired yeah. 
retired shoe head. So he's gonna ha- he's gonna school me on this one. But let's hear the top five retro Jordans of all time. I'm gonna look them up as we go. <laughs> see, uh, see, there's 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 shoes that um, are like the actual like originals. So I don't know whether to go for like my favorite originals of all time, like the the kind of first like Jordan Four or the first like like Jordan One. But I think um, I just went with kind of my favorite top five Jordans of all time. Um, so I've got number one. Or should I go five? I'll go five Start with first. number five. Okay. Actually, I've got, I got one, two, three. I've got f- five honorable mentions. So I can go, I can go top ten. <laughs> top ten. So we've got the, the Jordan 1 Unions, uh, without a doubt, are probably... They're a very good shoe. Uh, I've got the Jordan Six Dawnbeckers, which are again. Are you looking this up now? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, not, look them up? I'm, I'm <laughs> taking I'm taking notes so we can so we can put the picture up as we edit this. Yeah, they're they're very nice. Um, the Jordan One, not for sales. They do uh, kind of. I think they do a red one, uh, but they actually do the one that I like is the yellow one. Um, the I, I was looking at getting some. Uh, on StockX, but they're kind of like the twelve hundred pound mark, which is oh my God. a lot. Um, <laughs> You're expensive. The the Jordan One band, uh, for obvious reasons, MJ. Uh, they were the the shoe that obviously got the, the reason why they're called band is because they got, obviously got banned from the NBA. Um, kind of kind of makes sense, right? Um, and uh, then the Jordan Four Cause, uh, the grey one. They do a a black one as well, but I went for the grey one. And here's where we go for the nitty gritty, the top five. Um, the Travis Scott Jordan one, which is really hype beast, but it's the only one out of this list I actually have, so I'm going to put them in there. Um, the Jordan 4 Undefeated, which is a kind of an olive colour. They're kind of ones that you will never see. Uh, I think right now they're around the £15,000 mark. There's yeah. on stock X twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what? Which ones are those? What? what what's the? Which one of those? The Jordan or er, yeah, undefeated Jordan Four. Oh, okay. Is this right, Jordan Four Retro Undefeated. Yeah, they're like an olive color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah them. Laces. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, number three, the uh, Jordan One Fragments, which are what? Well, yeah, they're they're just an unreal shoe. Uh, there's something I'm actually looking to pull the trigger on now, uh, purely for the fact that they're they're just going to go up um, in price. I think they're about three now, and I think they're just going to go just crazy high. Um, and then we got the Off White Jordan Ones because Off White, and we're a hype beast. And then number one, uh, the Jordan One Colettes, which are I think they're probably going to be the most expensive one here. Do you have an estimated sticker price on those? Uh, oh. They're on for twenty three right now. Ooh. If you get if you if you try and get them in a size eight, they're one hundred and sixteen thousand. Wait, the Jordan one what? Uh, if you can see that. Which one? What's the name of them? Uh, that that uh, collapse. So. Uh, it's uh, C-O-L-E-G-E. That's crazy, man. I-, I hope this isn't hella offensive, but I look at that shoe and I'm like, it's a normal shoe. Like, I get, like, the Back to the Future ones, you know? I, yeah. I don't, I forget how much they cost. When I saw that shoe, I was like, that's that looks like a fucking neato shoe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, apparently, they're, like, like mad uncomfortable. Like, they're re- like you put them on and they just want to get them off immediately. Um, but I'd, I'd buy them for nostalgic reasons more than anything. Well, was it? Like, didn't Jordan? Didn't Jordan himself say that in the last dance? He was talking about how the ones that he wore in his last game were extremely uncomfortable. His feet were basically bleeding. Yeah. The funny thing about Jordans now. So if you go to like a Foot Locker or anything else like that, if you go there and actually buy a Jordan one, they would be completely different to what Jordan wore. So like he his um the cut of the shoe would be more like a um, a zoom so they, they do a kind of uh, a Jordan 1 zoom uh, they're, they're slightly higher cut 
um and they're they're just really like kind of comfortable so for him to say that the ones that he was wearing were kind of uncomfortable you got to think that the ones that we're wearing are even more uncomfortable if that's a word yeah most definitely I, I'm not a huge fan of the Jordan of, of the one in general. I'm not a, I don't, I don't know. I, I just, I can't get, I don't like the the high top. So maybe that's, that's probably sacrilege. I'm probably committing some sort of offense here, but uh, at number five, I got the thunder force. I'm a big fan of the force. Mm-hmm. Um, n- number four, the last, I'll, I'll take them interchangeably. The 13, the last shot or the Ferrari 13s. Those are both pretty nice. Um, at number three, I've got the powder blue threes. I think that's just a, a, a beautiful shoe right there. Good looking wear, wearing shoe. Um, number two, the black grape fives. I'm a sucker for anything that's purple. So I like the purple black combo there. And number one is that fear pack four. I have been looking at those for, for forever. Never actually pulled the trigger on them. So mine are a lot more generic, a lot lower sticker price than Jack. I'm an imposter. He is the master in this in this <laughs> domain, and he's even got a podcast where he talks a bit about shoes. I do believe, and the name of that is. Uh, the, yeah, it's funny because we're talking about the reps and reserve, but it's actually called the Creps and Reserve podcast. And I actually <laughs> did that. I did that passive aggressively because I thought, "Fuck." Yeah, fuck so take that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> when you get shoes this expensive, how many times do you wear them? And how do you determine? Because usually when people are shoe people like this, they have like an entire bedroom in their house dedicated to the shoes. How do you yeah. determine what shoe you're going to wear? And I how wore many- that one once in 2014. Um, like <laughs> that one, I, I took uh, my girl on her first date. We went to the yeah, movie. Do you, got a handy. Do you wear or do you just collect? So I wait. Let's see if I can take you. Here you go. Look at this. Uh, don't know if you can see that. Ah, no, you're not gonna be able to see this. Damn. Uh, there they are. Boxes. Uh, oh. Yeah, they're just. Um, they're all spread out. But um. So I wear some, but some are like kind of the investment ones. So I have the Jordan. The Travis Scott ones, and I bought them for retail at one five five, and they're currently at like the twelve hundred mark. So some of them might like if they're if I see like potential in them, then I'll just kind of keep them unworn, leave them alone, kind of three to four years. You got to think of them. Uh, some of them are like cars, so you got to think that as soon as you get a new car, you drive off the forecourt, and then it's going to kind of depreciate in value. The same with like a Jordan. Like if you buy a shoe and it's a fairly like rare shoe it's a fairly sought after shoe instead of kind of uh selling it there and then don't wear it uh, like kind of have it like a car don't drive off the forecourt um and then give it like i don't know four to five years you're probably looking at uh like four to five times what you pay for it quite easily i feel as well. that i feel that dude like if somebody was gonna sell me a car and they were like oh yeah i fucked in this car before i'd be like cool but if somebody was gonna sell me a shoe and they're like i wore this I'd be like, yeah. ah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. especially uh, especially <laughs> now, like the the whole um, used sneaker buying and selling has gone really, it's gone to crap because of obviously the uh, coronavirus kind of hitting hitting everyone. So no one really buys uh, used shoes uh, like anymore. Uh, I don't know if it's going to pick up again, but I have high doubts. Like I think people were just going to buy shoes unworn um, for obviously fear of catching coronavirus. <laughs> I'm so far disconnected, and I know we're probably coming up to that time, but you, you mentioned that when a new shoe comes out and you see potential in it. So, like, are there things that you look for where you're like, oh, man, you know, this might be special. Like, in, in four or five years, I think this shoe might be worth some. And have you ever thought that about a shoe and been completely wrong? And you're like, these are not taking me anywhere. And what makes yeah. it right? So, normally, um, so... Nike will almost always drive a shoe to be hyped. Like if they, if you want, if they want you to be hyped up about a shoe, they will do one of two things. They will give it to an influencer. For example, a massive one right now is is Travis Scott. Um, he's kind of like the the first person they'll like hype a shoe up to. So if they like want you to be interested in the, have you guys heard of the Ben and Jerry's dunks that have just come out? Yep. Right, you would have probably heard of that because. 
Travis Scott has worn that shoe. Like Nike have given him that shoe. He's worn the shoe. It's been on Instagram. It's got hyped up. Everyone's talking about it. That's kind of how Nike does things. The other thing is kind of having very limited quantities. Um, so, for example, if they want a shoe to be really hyped and really sought after in four to five years, what they'll do is they'll just say, look, we're going to make 100 pairs of this. You're either going to hit or you're going to miss. And you'll kind of never, you'll never see these again. If you want to buy these, these are going to be like, 30 grand in about four years um that's another one and also the uh, the last one which is rare of night to do but they'll make a shoe that's crazy crazy high quality and stamp a massive markup on it um so for example i remember they did um i think i think it was a crocodile skin air force one um and it was made in italy and it was kind of like they were all handmade they weren't like machines or anything it was all like uh properly done and they i think they retail for like 180 um and there was something like 150 pairs uh or actually no there's 123 pairs and um they sold out pretty much instantly i think they're i'm pretty sure they're the most expensive shoe in the world right now um just because of the quality of the shoe not necessarily it's kind of the quality and obviously the quantity there uh so that's just how Nike does things so if i ever see like something be if i ever see something with low quantity and i see a shoe with high quality or i see a, see a shoe that's getting hyped up because some of someone like travis scott on instagram like like being or like wearing the shoe uh then i'll tend to go for it one thing that i did do is go for the um uh they're the stussy uh what are they called uh, i can't even remember the name of them I think they called the Spiridons, uh, the Stussy Spiridon cages, and basically Nike gave it to Travis Scott. Travis Scott hyped it up. I bought it for one thirty. It's now sitting at like the last time I checked, it was sitting at three seventy, uh, and now it just keep going up. So yeah, that's wild. You ever been wrong about a shoe? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the good thing is with shoes is that you'll never lose money on it. So if I bought a shoe for like one fifty and I was wrong about the shoe, then I would not, I, if I didn't wear it, then I could sell that shoe for 150. It would, ne- it would hardly ever go below retail unless you wear it, which is the good thing about sneakers, really. It's quite a solid investment. Um, there's, yeah, there's really, it's very rare for you to lose money on a shoe. And if you do lose money on the shoe, then you tend to wear it. That sounds tough, though, man. Like, if they only make 100 shoes, I'd be like, man, there's, like, no chance I'm getting this shoe. Like, <laughs> you see somebody yeah. post that on their story all the time, how they sign up for the Nike thing, and it says, like, oh, you've not been selected. It's like, I think I've only, I've only ever seen you've not been selected. Yeah. See, yeah, everyone will always... See, the thing is with sneakers that everyone will post the, like, the the L, and they'll never post the, the W. It's kind of a bit weird. Where, like, we're kind of the opposite of... Or, yeah, they're kind of the opposite of the, the fitness influencer. They're kind of like... They're, <laughs> <laughs> the fitness influencer will only post like the wins and their PBs and stuff, whereas as the the sneakerheads will always post like, oh, I missed out on this shoe. <laughs> so Jack, with all those expensive uh, shoes in your house, do you want to share your address with everyone? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. It's uh, MJ, uh, Michael Jordan, Florida. Uh, <laughs> Put Thomas Neal's address right at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, all right, Jack, we are coming up on that time. Is there anything that you want to leave the people with, where they can find you, Instagram, where they can reach out for coaching, things like that? Yeah, no, uh, I appreciate you guys for having me on. Always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, yeah, so I'm basically hooked up to Instagram. Um, as discussed, I don't really go on anything else, but that is Rainer Trainer. Or, or often people call me Reiner Trainer, but it's Reiner Trainer. Um, we have uh, the Creps and Reserve podcast, which talks about sneakers if you're interested. And also we have the Recreational Bodybuilding podcast, which is basically uh, one run kind of one every two weeks. The other one runs one every two weeks, and we kind of have one every single week come out. Um, and we basically just talk about bodybuilding for the general population. So there we are. Right on. Well, as always, like, comment, subscribe. You can find us on Instagram at Gifted Performance. I am at the underscore squat father. We've got at Polly underscore rocket and at Cameron underscore cheek. Thanks for coming by today. Thanks for watching, and we will see you on the next one. Stay gifted. Mm.